Good afternoon, everyone. I'm uh, Jay Volpe. I'm the uh, token neurologist. Uh, usually, when I see my cardiovascular colleagues, I'm a poor prognostic indicator as a stroke neurologist. And I think this is the one time of year everyone's happy to see me in the hallways. So we'll get started. I, I will be uh, running through quite a bit on um, medical management and diagnosis of stroke. And uh, if we have a moment or two at the end, I'd like to share some new innovations in our field. Let's see, there we go. So, you know, stroke is really uh, broadly defined as a, a focal brain injury uh, caused by a disruption of blood flow. Uh, some other diseases that can cause uh, brain injury from a lack of blood flow would be like a hypoxic injury, a global hypoxic injury. We generally don't consider that a stroke. Uh, or trauma can cause a disruption of blood flow. We don't consider that stroke. So we're really talking about something with the intrinsic circulation of the brain causing a lack of blood flow. So when we talk about types of stroke, the, about five out of six strokes that we see are ischemic strokes in, in the U.S. Depending on where you are in the world, those numbers may be a little bit different. Um, and of course, ischemia is that state of tissue starvation. And it can be reversed or it can be irreversible. So if it's reversed, we call that a TIA. And uh, if it's irreversible but not associated with clinical symptoms, we call that silent ischemia. And uh, the terms are kind of misused by patients. So you may hear patients tell you that their CAT scan has shown a lot of TIAs, which wouldn't be the case. A CAT scan that shows a lot of uh, features might show a lot of silent ischemia. So, Ischemic stroke is kind of the, the core uh, of what I do, uh, and, and many diseases cause ischemic stroke, and of course, we're, we're here with cardiologists. Many of the things that go on with the heart are uh, related to uh, ischemic stroke. And when one of the things that we try and do is get to the bottom of the cause, the, the etiology or the, the, the categorization, and the TOAST criteria are the criteria that we use. Now, TOAST is really a, uh, an anachronism. It's a study that was done that was uh, negative, and, and it really doesn't mean anything anymore, but the criteria that were developed for that study are, are what are uh, still used. And so uh, when we use this algorithm, we come up with our diagnosis, and we tell our patient, you've had a stroke from cardioembolism, whatever the case is. And it turns out that when we make that diagnosis, even when we think we're right, if we follow those patients over time, about one in three times, we change our diagnosis. So the, there is no gold standard for a diagnosis of stroke, and often it is a uh, shifting uh, diagnosis. So these are the common types of stroke, a large artery atherosclerosis, cardioembolism, small vessel occlusion, strokes of other determined etiologies such as a dissection, hemodynamic insufficiency, moi moi or vasculitis, and then uh, what sometimes called cryptogenic stroke or stroke of undetermined etiology. You can end up in that category because there's a couple of competing possibilities and you're just not sure which it is, or because you simply did an evaluation and you don't know what it is, or there was not a complete evaluation. So for large artery atherosclerosis, uh, this would be blood flowing to, from the heart to the brain through these large arteries, uh, the carotid arteries or the vertebral arteries in the back. And in um, most patients, the carotid arteries are very similar in size. They may have some difference in tortuosity, but the vertebral arteries are, are paired but often different in size. So about 80% of the population is going to have a dominant vertebral artery. And you may see a report that says the left vertebral artery is uh, hypoplastic, or even saw one yesterday, severely hypoplastic. It sounds like something bad. It's actually just a normal variant. When you get up to the uh, circle of Willis, the uh, vertebral may not even make it to the circle of Willis. It may actually have a, a little bit of a turn there into the, the pica artery. And so depending on the anatomy, it may be a uh, highly dominant uh, vertebral that's uh, supplying the, the back of the brain. So all that is a very important, especially if you're looking at patients who have some dizzy symptoms and you're trying to decide whether a vertebral stenosis could be a cause, vertebral bowser insufficiency, knowing what's going on with their vertebrals and whether or not they're at risk of steel, and, and that is, is important. Of course, the cervical willis itself is generally um, uh, variant. It's very uncommon to see a textbook uh, circle of willis uh, in which all the branches are, are there. Uh, most patients will have either missing PCOM, sometimes what we call fetal origin of a posterior cerebral artery, meaning that the posterior cerebral artery comes directly from the carotids. So all these variants are common. They're not uh, necessarily pathological, but they help us to understand why certain strokes occur um, in, in locations. Uh, this is just another view from the, the base of the brain. And again, depending on the patient, these arteries may come directly 
the posterior cerebral con can come from the carotid and uh, different uh, variations. So in general, though, the, the circle of Willis is, is just like this Mecham fountain that we all passed coming in. It's a way of recirculating blood. It's the natural bypass of the brain. And ischemia results when there's a failure of the circle of Willis. And, and that can occur uh, from a large artery atheroma that forms and ruptures. But more often, it actually comes from uh, occlusion from a, from a uh, artery to artery embolism or cardioembolism. So this is the, what would it look like if you have that plaque. It usually forms at the bifurcation of the carotid and uh, can uh, either simply choke off the flow or embolize distally into the brain. As far as cardioembolism, I don't need to tell an audience of cardiologists what cardioembolism is, but it's most often caused by atrial fibrillation, less commonly heart failure, valve disease, and uh, you can assess your risk of AFib looking at the CHADS2 VAS scores. And um, if you're interested in other causes of cardioembolism, just as a quick aside, you wouldn't consider PFO to be in the cardioembolism category. It's just a, uh, it's technically put in the cryptogenic category still. But uh, if you see a patient in which their workup is negative and you're trying to decide how likely is, is the PFO you found the cause of a stroke, you can look up on MedCalc a ROPE score, and that's very helpful for determining uh, the likelihood that a PFO is contributing. When discussing with patients uh, and not cardiologists, I'll describe a cardioembolic stroke as being like a pinball in a pinball machine. It's basically finding its way from uh, the, the origin up into the brain and wherever it lands it's, it's going to go. Now, when we talk about AFib clots, AFib clots are, are really, you know, the left atrium is, a, is much, much larger than the middle cerebral artery. So it's much more like a bullet to the brain than a pinball. And the reason I point that out is that embolic strokes, when we see them on imaging, almost always completely occlusive of the middle cerebral artery. This idea of multifocal, seeing infarcts in, other, in many different territories of the brain being a sign of embolism is actually very uncommon. Unless they're microemboli coming from like valve debris or something like that, these macroemboli from uh, AFib are usually going to have one territory and be completely occlusive. So you can uh, evaluate for that with a TTE. Uh, you can, of course, look for AFib. And we know that patients go in and out of AFib. So if you wish to, to test beyond the hospital stay, you might want to consider uh, implantable loop recorders. If in a cryptogenic stroke or a patient for, with occult AFib, you'll find AFib in about 10% of patients per year uh, with loop recorders. The term uh, lacunar infarct is sometimes commingled with small vessel disease. I prefer small vessel disease because lacun just means a small area of injury. It could come from any number of diseases. But small vessel disease means that uh, the patient's developing lipohyalinosis of their small arteries, and it's usually in many different arteries. So if you look at their brain, you're going to find nine small vessel ischemic changes for every one clinical attack. So those patients will very rarely present with a single new lacoon. It's almost always in, in the company it keeps with many other silent ones. Of course, our typical uh, risk factors for atherosclerosis are the same for large and small vessel. And uh, these patients have soft symptoms. They don't necessarily have a focal hemiplegia. They may have memory loss. They may have mood disorders. So this is what, uh, what we're talking about. These are the MRIs you're going to see where there's many more of these tiny uh, changes before the patient presents with a clinical syndrome. Uh, all of this would be small vessel disease. This uh, kind of what we call geographic or wedge-shaped infarct of, of the uh, MCA back here is not small vessel disease. So other determined etiologies, we lump these uh, somewhat together because they're relatively rare. Uh, dissection is going to be in, uh, more often in your younger patients, certainly more often in smokers, uh, and trauma to the next, such as chiropractors or uh, MVAs would be your main cause. Moya Moya is uh, your young patient who has occlusion of the distal carotid, not that carotid bifurcation, but the intracranial portion of the carotid. Uh, vasculitis, often invoked, rarely present. Uh, you'll find that uh, off, more often in the ACA territory. So most strokes are going to occur in the middle cerebral artery. Vasculitis, for some reason, will occur more often in the anterior cerebral artery. Uh, clotting disorders, uh, metabolic disorders should be looked for. Um, but really, when we look for patients who uh, have this other determined etiology, even though they're individually rare, collectively we probably have one to two patients a month that have these rare diseases. And uh, other things to keep in mind, not a stroke. So stroke mimics. Patients present with a focal hemiparesis and a headache, and then you uh, work them up. Nothing is found in terms of their circulation. 
and you find that it's more likely a hemiplegic migraine. Of course, TIA, we talked about earlier. Uh, the textbook definition is that the symptoms resolve in under 24 hours, but in reality, if you deprive the brain of blood for more than one to two hours, you almost always see an infarct. Why is that important? So if your patient has a negative MRI, but their symptoms are lasting for one to two days, that's very, cons that's very consistent with something other than a vascular etiology. So it's helpful to kind of see a negative MRI in a patient who has persistent symptoms. Averted stroke is a term that we use. Uh, in other words, the patient had uh, stroke symptoms, had a vascular cause, we intervened, we gave something, and it kept them from having a stroke. Um, bleeding strokes, this is the other one out of six patients. They're easily identified. We wouldn't include the ischemic strokes that, that convert, and we wouldn't can, uh, include aneurysms or subdurals. So these are all the different bleeds you can have. Uh, the ones that are caused by hypertension are usually the deep structures, those basal ganglia, thalami, uh, pons, and cerebellum. The ones that are important for you all are the amyloid, the low bar bleeds. Why are those important? Because that's going to be a patient who could bleed for no good reason. Even if their blood pressure is well controlled, that patient's on anticoagulation, they're much higher risk of having rebleeds. So pay attention to the low bar hemorrhages. So if a patient has a stroke, what we can do, what can we do for them? Of course, TPA is our longstanding, now 20 plus year therapy, clot buster. Uh, there are other clot busters now in the pipeline that might, uh, TNK, which you all are familiar with, uh, is probably going to find a, a role in stroke soon. When we give TPA uh, right now, we're still with a four and a half hour window, I say right now, because uh, we're likely going to be using more imaging-based protocols that allow us to include wake-up strokes, include patients in which time frames aren't clear, and we can say that the patient is still has tissue at risk. Uh, some things you don't want to do, of course, if they're bleeding, if their blood pressure is uncontrolled, if it's too late or the pam, uh, patient or family refuse. Rapidly resolving is um, something that we've gone back and forth with. So basically, a patient that's fluctuating or rapidly resolving but still has disabling deficits will give TPA to a patient who's resolved to the point where they're no longer disabling, we're avoiding TPA now. So this is your overall benefit to TPA is that you'll, you'll cut out a few patients from having a, a disabling stroke at the cost of one patient having a hemorrhage um, compared uh, in the NIN uh, studies. We've gotten about twice as good than the NIN studies at preventing bleeds, so really only about half a patient bleeding now. The major innovation for us is what you all have been doing for a while, which is going in with catheters. Uh, we've been doing liquid plumber, now we're doing rotor rooter. So this is uh, uh, LVOs, or large vessel occlusions. If you put an E, emergent large vessel occlusions. Onset analysis in 24 hours, imaging-based criteria. Um, other things you can use, of course, aspirin or clopidogrel, aspirin plus clopidogrel. Um, just a brief word about that. We're usually using dual antiplatelets now in patients who have minor symptoms and uh, patients who are uh, lower risk of hemorrhagic inversion. Uh, we're not typically using ticagrelor. It is safe in its, in its one study, but no more effective than aspirin. Uh, we're avoiding prasagril uh, because of a boxed warning against it, and we usually don't use anticoagulants up front. Uh, we try to get the patient triaged in under 60 minutes. Your stroke team consists of, of course, the ER personnel and uh, all of the folks who respond. And then uh, our typical in-hospital evaluation, we mentioned CT, MRIs are getting uh, very important for even emergent evaluation. EKG, telemetry, probably lipid panel, the only one lab you absolutely need, and uh, practice variability there. So hospital goals, we want to stabilize, get the patient to rehab. And I think I've almost run out of time, so I'll just uh, say, uh, one quick thing about um, the emerging therapies for stroke is that we're really looking at imaging. So if a patient has a stroke and it's not clear when they were last seen normal or the last seen normal from the nursing staff, it goes beyond that four and a half hours, uh, do think of getting those patients to our advanced imaging with CT perfusions, MR perfusions, and we can get some uh, therapies to those patients now beyond four and a half hours. Thank you very much.